Hello everyone, welcome to the 23rd episode of Chapters, Real People, Real Stories. Tonight, I welcome in my friend Jordan Furch. Uh, this is actually not her first podcast experience, so she's probably one of the few guests outside of my twin brother that's had some experience coming in, so that's awesome to hear. She definitely doesn't seem shy or at all to be in front of the camera, but Jordan, uh, really appreciate you joining this Friday night on the show. So how are you doing, and, and what's it like for being on the Chapters podcast for the first time? Yeah, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and uh, share what we're doing here in the community with the Isaiah 117 house. Yeah, well, like I said, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I was just mentioning during the pregame show uh, that, you know, when I reached out to you, I actually wanted to give you that origin story beforehand. It's not extremely long, but it's just how we kind of came connected is uh, we did have a mutual friend, from my understanding, that had kind of told me about your guys' nonprofit organization, and they referenced me specifically to you. Like, you, you're someone that, you, you know, you had great character too, but you also, I think, could really uh, talk about this organization at a high level and be able to help get that word out there about what you guys are doing and, and what the what the cause is for. But Usually, like I like to do, Jordan, for these shows is I'll have a chapter one, which is to give the give the audience a chance to get to know the voice behind the mic, and also on, on your end. So this first chapter is called "Who Is Jordan Furch?" So Jordan, let's kind of start with the foundation of your life so far. So can you tell us tell us a little bit about where you were born and raised, uh, about your mother and father, and any siblings that you have? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name's Jordan Furch. I am formerly Jordan Smith. I grew up in Spencer County, so just next door neighbors to Perry County. I uh, grew up in Christney, and uh, my parents, Todd and Faye Smith, um, was raised in Christney my whole life. Uh, my mom uh, works as a school bus driver at the uh, elementary school that I went to school at, Christney Elementary, and uh, my dad is a construction worker and builds homes. So um, growing up, I had two siblings. I have a sister, Hannah, who is 18 months younger, and a brother, Jesse, who is seven years younger, and uh, I'm the oldest. So uh, growing up in Christney was, um, was great. It was a normal, um, really good childhood. Um, we did, you know, just the normal things, the t-ball in the summer and, um, you know, 4-H and all of that stuff. So it was really um, a good childhood, uh, just some of the memories that I have growing up, all of them, of course, are good, but um, just on Sundays, we always went to church with my family, and um, a lot of our extended family went to the same church, and so every Sunday after church, I would get to go home with my grandparents, and um, my grandma made meatloaf, which I know most people are not fans of, but it was the best meatloaf ever. <laughs> Uh, and so we would eat meatloaf and then, uh, after a while we would meet up with my cousins and go on bike rides. So, um, just a really normal childhood, but really a good childhood. Well, that's really good information you shared there, Jordan, especially about your family and your siblings and, and also some memories of your community and, and growing up. And, and like you mentioned, meatloaf. I didn't expect meatloaf to be mentioned on the show tonight, but I, I love it. I mean, I, I do love meatloaf. My mom used to make that too, whenever we were kids. And, and it's just really cool because it, it, even just in that short amount of time that you discussed there, like when you mentioned your community and you mentioned Christy, that being familiar with this area as well, didn't grow up around there and familiar with it, but it does have that. You, you just kind of did a really good job of making me feel like I was there. Like, you know, you feel like you grew up there. You, you love that small town that you have there in the closeness. I'm actually going to kind of put you on the spot with your first organic question tonight because I think this would be an easy one for you. But so I'm going to consider it a softball. I'm just going to toss it up there and see how how you knock it out of the park. But but you know we we, we did go through your mother and father. And you talked a little bit about their you know what they do for a career. But I'm also curious too because I can see you kind of boom with pride when you talked about your family. Uh, you, you definitely seem very family oriented, and I'm very curious if you can tell me on the spot when it comes to your mom and your dad. You know, what is it about them even character wise growing up? Because now, you know, we're full grown adults. You have a family yourself. You know, what have they done that has inspired you to be, you know, the work ethic that you have, but also like you being a mother and a wife yourself? How did that, how have they had a hand in that? Yeah, I think for my mom, she has always been so family oriented. She's never let um, a career or a hobby get in the way of family. Um, she's also, she's always placed a high priority on it um, and still continues to this day. Um, her parents have both passed away, but watching my mom care for her parents and just doing it with um, just 
so second nature to her. Um, it was always just, you know, that's what you do. You care for your parents, just like they've always cared for you. And, you know, you don't complain about it. It's just what you do. Um, and so just her selfless giving, um, has definitely, um, something that I want to aspire to do with my own family to just, um, give and give to my family without ever expecting anything back in return. Um, and then as far as my dad, he's always, um, just had such a fun and laid back personality has never taken um, anything too seriously and still even tells us to this day, you know, don't take yourself too serious and um, just really want to take that as well that I feel like there's so many things that can be um, grabbing for your attention these days and just, you know, to have fun with it and um, just don't take life too serious and you'll be all right. I love that. I love how you went into the detail there about your family and, how, and the impact they had on them. Another thing that we wanted to touch on, too, is like your education background, like you know, whether that be high school, uh, college or beyond that. You know, I want to ask you, like, if you can recall, uh, especially for me, I think the easiest way for you this is I've talked with other guests is like when we think back to high school, there's a lot of things that we still remember from there. I'm sure it's not everything was like always lollipops and gumdrops, but there's still moments where we have, have special memories or even people or friends that we've met that we really appreciate from back then. So like whenever I talk about your, your education memories there, what are some of the things that stand out, whether it's academically or people that have made an impact on you? Is there anything that you'd like to share there? Yeah, so um, I graduated from Heritage Hills High School in 2008, and in high school, I didn't do a ton of sports and extracurriculars. Um, that was more my sister's thing. I was more just kind of sit back and watch, um, but I was involved in a Bible study there, and my Bible study leader, uh, Mr. Wilkerson, he's still a teacher at Heritage Hills today, um, he actually adopted two kids from um, another country. I can't remember exactly where, but, um, anyways, watching him, I think, um, he was an excellent teacher, excellent role model, Bible study leader, but, um, watching him be a dad to kids that weren't biologically his own, um, had a huge impact on me, um, and was definitely, um, just kind of one of the stepping stones in me having an interest in foster care and adoption and just, um, seeing how families can operate and love each other, um, even if they aren't biologically related. So, um, yeah, so that was high school. Um, after high school, I went to, <laughs> I'll finish with my education. Oh, yeah, uh, go for it, go for it. I went to uh, the University of Southern Indiana in Evansville and majored in social work. So I had my bachelor's in social work and um, yeah, got that there. See, I was curious about that, too, because I, I, I didn't know what your background was, especially on, on the college level. But I was, if I had to guess, I was thinking it's got to be something to do with social work or something like that. Because yeah. like, you, you, you definitely seem like that's right up your alley and you're very passionate about it. I do want to acknowledge one of the first comments, and I do appreciate someone sharing it as well. But uh, Emily Ann had made a comment on here that says, awesome ministry, and thanks for sharing, Jordan. She put a heart emoji on there as well. So, Emily, thank you for your comment. And like I said, I do encourage the audience to continue to, to add comments under like Emily has as well. And we'll continue to call those out through the show. And like I said, it just feels like one big conversation with each other. Only, only Jordan and I can actually speak <laughs> through here. But you guys can are welcome to talk to us through the chat. Uh, but lastly, too, uh, just to dive into a little bit more about your career, can you tell me more details about what you do now for a living and, and your career and everything from that point? Yeah, so I graduated from college in 2013. And with that, um, so my senior year of college, uh, you do your senior internship. Mine was with the Department of Child Services. And so I did my senior internship at Pike County um, in Petersburg. Department of Child Services. And then once I graduated, I signed an agreement with the department um, to continue working with them for two years. So I continued working with them, um, except I switched offices and went to the Dubois County Department of Child Services office and worked there as a caseworker. Um, I worked there until, un until 2015. And that's whenever uh, we had our first child, little girl, and decided to stay home with her and have been a stay-at-home mom ever since. I love that. That's awesome. You actually made me think of another good question to ask you there because it's kind of actually several because it's, it's fun to see your little journey uh, to where you're at now there. But one of the stood out to me is 
is a couple of like first experience questions. Like one of the end, like you mentioned your internship. So you're coming out of college and you're, or maybe you're still finishing things up there, but you're doing the internship and you're kind of more there in, in the thick of things. But what was that experience like for you, your, your first day, like on the job in the, as an intern for you? Do you remember that? Yeah. So I always knew that I wanted, um, probably, so I have a cousin that was adopted um, from China back in 1999. And whenever I saw um, that take place and see that um, kids were able to be loved by parents that weren't biologically their own, um, that just kind of lit a spark in me and it never really faded. Um, Continued on through high school with Mr. Wilkerson, watching him with his kids, um, and then into college, knowing that that's what what I wanted to do in some way. So whenever um, I saw that you could do your internship with the Department of Child Services, I immediately jumped on it, had no idea what I was getting into because I had always seen it from an outsider's perspective of, you know, oh, here's this cute family. They might look, you know, not look like each other, but, you know, it's perfect and it's great. And you don't see all the struggles that, you know, can come in blended families sometimes. Um, So on my first day um, or my first week um, as an intern, so we walk into this home and, um, you know, your your whole goal is reunification and, you know, just making things work and putting services in place and all of that. Um, We walk into this home and they have a pet deer inside their home. It's a small, double wide and I think, what am I getting myself into? (laughs) I have never seen a deer inside a house in my entire life. Um, so that was, that was interesting. That was, you know, you learned very quick that not everybody lives the same way as you and that's okay. It's just, you got to roll with it. And what works for some people doesn't work for others. No, uh, I love it. You're like the, you're like the perfect guest for first tonight. Like I didn't, didn't expect meatloaf and I didn't expect (laughs) a deer inside someone's home for the first time. So I love that though. I mean, I think my reaction would probably be very much the same. Uh, another kind of very similar question, organic. I, I love trying to tap into people's emotions as far as like these first experiences here and there. And another one you mentioned, like as a as a caseworker, when you're moved up and you're, you're taking on your first case, which I'm sure you have many, and you, and you've also done where or you're somewhere more challenging than others. Some of them were, were like maybe hit closer to the best than others. But like for you, that first case that you dealt with like full time do you recall in, in detail what that was like for you emotionally everything did you did you feel rewarding in those certain certain situations where you're able to help people yeah I mean I think it's definitely a pull kind of pull and push kind of situation um you know you you feel accomplished you know if you can help the family but then you can feel also really defeated whenever it doesn't work out or they're, you know, you see them back in the office in six months or whatever. Um, so it's constant balancing act. And then I think also, um, especially pertaining to the kids, um, when I worked at the department of child services, I didn't have any kids of my own. So those kids were my kids in a sense. And I kind of felt like they were, you know, a motherly sense with them and, uh, really wanted to look out for them. And so it really was a struggle trying to turn off um, work mode and go into home mode on my drive home um, because I was constantly wanting to carry my workload home and carry those emotions home and then, um, you know, hash it all out with my husband. And, you know, truth is at the end of the night, like we don't want to talk about work. We should, you know, be able to talk about other things and not have our lives revolve around um, work. So it was constantly a balancing act of um trying to and wanting to love these kids but also knowing that it's my job i'm here to do my job i can't let my emotions get in the way of these decisions um all of that yeah i mean you did a fantastic job explaining to me and again you're you're also making me ask a lot of organic questions because it's just (laughs) they all tie together so well because another one i thought of is again you're a mother yourself now and (laughs) and you know, going through this course and you, you, you dealt with your level of children and, and, and different harder circumstances and other, like you said, the rewarding part. And I could definitely understand it's got to be really hard in that profession to, to not take certain things home. But I'm sure there's some things that you can take from it on a positive level that you do take home and you embrace that. So I'm, my question would be is, what are some of the positive things that you've taken from your job or your career and, your, and the experiences you've had that 
that makes you look at your own kids differently or makes you uh, deal with them from a challenge every day. Because like I said, I'm not a father myself. I told you that before the show, I have like five fur babies. But, you know, kids are going to be kids and sometimes they're going to drive you crazy. I mean, so I'm kind of, of course, I could see that maybe being one of the things that maybe it causes you to be a little bit more patient with them. Maybe it causes you to, to like understand them more to, to where you can kind of button those things up. Or what? But to revert back to the question itself, you know, what are some of the things that you might – uh, embrace to take home that that you might apply to your own children yeah yeah I think just um always from the get-go we've always um my kids are five and two so definitely the two-year-old probably doesn't understand a whole lot yet but um particularly with our five-year-old right now we're really trying to um gently expose her to just not just foster care but knowing and making her aware that um, not all kids come from a home that, you know, is stable and loving and can provide food and, you know, a roof over their head and, um, just gently exposing her to that, making her aware, um, that those kids are out there and making sure that she's grateful for what we do have. Um, but that we just kind of hold everything that we have with an open hand. Um, we never want to, you know, clench onto, our money or our possessions or anything like that. We want to, you know, have it open-handedly. So if someone else needs it, then we're able to give that to them. And we really want to instill that in our kids that it's not something that we should just grab onto and hold on to and think it's mine, 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 that there's always someone out there that could need it and that can need it. And uh, just making her aware of that. Yeah, I mean, I love the way that you describe it. And it's, it's very inspiring just whenever you're talking about how that all applies together. But but now it's kind of going to chapter two. I think this is a really interesting, this is what I call the special segment of the show is again, talking about this nonprofit organization. And I I remember when I, when, I, when I first started researching a little bit more, I mean, right from the get-go, from the jump, I was like, I definitely would love to talk about this on the show. I'd definitely love to have Jordan come on to speak on it as well. Uh, but you also like lead, lead into the description or a mutual friend of mine uh, told me a little bit about it going in what you guys are what you guys do. Uh, I've read the description on the Facebook page and I actually screenshotted one of them where I found more of some a detailed kind of description of it where you guys basically talked about the scenario of what what children face whenever they first go into that type of situation and it's it's pretty rough it's it's heartbreaking whenever you when I read most of it because I was sitting there thinking my god you know if they're just sitting there with like just the clothes on their back in certain scenarios or they don't like depending on the age they don't have toys or different things to keep them uh, a place to go until they figure things out until things get ironed out so i mean uh, like oh, i'd lo- love to, to touch on it you kind of you, you really did kind of touch on this uh, earlier on on the uh, first chapter about the inspiration part but i'd still like to ask you once again when it comes to this organization directly you know can you tell us again a little bit about what's inspired you to get involved yeah so i had a mutual friend on facebook reach out to me um it's been a couple of years now And they were telling me that Evansville was getting an Isaiah 117 house and that they were having a kickoff for it and that I should go. Um, This mutual friend knew me from college, so they knew that I was involved in child welfare and that, you know, my background with it. And so I looked into it and immediately whenever I read what the Isaiah 117 house was doing, I knew that it's something that we absolutely needed in our community. Um, One way that I specifically related to it was um, there was a time whenever I worked at the Department of Child Services that I had gone out in the middle of the night. I had removed uh, a little eight-year-old girl and brought her back to the office trying to find placement for her. Uh, We were there for several hours and all she wanted to do was sleep. It was in the middle of the night. She's traumatized. It's just been, you know, the worst night of her life. And the only thing that I had to offer to her was the jacket that I had worn into the office, um, which is awful whenever you think about it and thinking back on it that, you know, this child has just been removed from their home. And although it didn't meet our standards, it met hers because it was home and that was her safe place. We removed her from her safe place and we brought her to an office and had her lay on the floor surrounded by cubicles and we couldn't even give her a blanket. All we had was a jacket to cover her up with. And um, that's just, uh, so whenever the Isaiah 117 house was coming to Evansville, I thought, well, this is perfect. That can fit 
that can meet that need for that little girl instead of having to come back to the cubicle and sleep on the floor covered up by a caseworker's jacket, they can go to a home and they can be, you know, tucked into a bed with sheets and blankets and fresh linens and all of that. And just, it seems so simple, but in trauma, that's, that's huge. Yeah. I mean, that, that story is heartbreaking. I couldn't imagine like, like what, uh, like you did a good job of like putting me there in the situation with your kid, but it almost like you're in a way you're trying to help the child, but it, but in that same moment, I'm sure there's parts where you feel like helpless, like a, like at least on a resource level, but you did a good job at saying too, is like for that child, imagining like the mind of an eight year old, you know, to them, that's still their home. That's their life. That's their safe place. And you're removing from that. And it, it would be hard to expect them to understand that. I could imagine how traumatizing it is, but I can see how even just that one experience on top of your friend's, uh, you know, recommendation and, and them getting involved too, that'll have they can inspire you to get involved in this. Now, also again, I think you kind of described it there in some detail too, but but just to go into a little bit more, could you also describe for the audience what services you guys provide both personally and what your team, you and your team provide as a whole overall? Yeah. So the Isaiah 117 house um, is going to be a home where we're gonna meet needs of the child, of the caseworker and of the foster family. So like I said, whenever kids are removed from their homes, they're brought back to the Department of Child Services office. This is standard practice all through the state of Indiana, all over the country. Um, and they're brought back there to wait for a foster placement or relative placement or group home, whatever the situation might be. Um, on average, that wait time is eight hours. So you know, to us, eight hours might not seem that long. To a child, that is a long time to be sitting in a sea of cubicles. Um, I don't know how many people have ever seen the Department of Child Services office, but it is. I mean, it's just standardized furniture, cubicle after cubicle. There's no home setting about it. Um, and so we want this home to be somewhere where this child can be brought. Once they're removed from their home, they'll be brought to the Isaiah 117 house and be met by volunteers. And these volunteers will be able to assist in if that child you want to go out and play outside. Okay, well, we have a playground in the background or in the backyard. Let's go out there. Or if they're dirty and need a bath, well, let's come in here and take a bubble bath. And we have bath toys. Or if you're a teenager, we got a shower upstairs, anything like that. Um, because before this, if they were taken back to the Department of Child Services office, they're going to be bathed in the same sink that drug tests are performed in. So it's not a bath setting that anyone wants to be in. Um, if this child needs new clothes, we're going to have clothes fully stocked any size at the home. So we'll be able to meet those needs as well. That volunteer will also be able to um, interact and care for that child. So that relieves the burden on the caseworker. So the caseworker has tons of paperwork to do in the first 24 to 48 hours of removal. And so that caseworker is going to be able to do that paperwork and get it all done while still having eyes on the child. But that volunteer will be there to help watch the child, meet the needs, all of that. Um, so it's not so much a balancing act for the caseworker. And then once a foster family is found, we're gonna be able to have the foster family ideally come pick the child up from the Isaiah 117 home. And if that foster family needs anything at all to care for that child, then we're gonna be able to provide it. So if that foster family needs a car seat, if they need a crib, if they need a backpack for school the next day, anything they might need, we're gonna have a storage room there at the home that's gonna just be fully stocked for anything that they might need. So hopefully that placement will be more successful. Um, and like I said, this home's gonna be fully stocked with volunteers uh, just from the community. Well, I, I know it really sticks out to me there more than anything is just like, like, like you said, the balancing act for the caseworker. I was imagining that yeah, eight hours is a long time. I couldn't sit there for eight hours in this standard design building as a full grown man. But I mean, I can't imagine what that's like for the imagination of a child, you know, whenever, you know, they're already traumatized or going through all these things, but you know, they might still have those moments of what can be done to ease their suffering or give them more comfort or, or keep them occupied even like kind of give them a little bit of a temporary escapism from from the current situation and it sounds like that what you guys are providing too it's almost like a bridge 
to to help in all these different avenues there that they all kind of feel like you're on different islands in that in that scenario to me and and this organization kind of provides that outlet for them it gives comfort for the children that are involved in the situation it eases stress and maybe even anxiety level for the caseworker where they sure they gotta get all this paperwork done but i imagine your guys' profession too that it could be a lot of paperwork but it's also very like you guys want to be perfectionists about it you want to do it right the first time you don't want to make mistakes on that type of paperwork or errors you want to make sure your messages are conveyed and everything's set so uh, that's what i get from it over there all because my next question was kind of about short term and long term goes and and correct me if i'm wrong jordan but it seems like you've really touched on that particular question there i want to think i thought a good twist to that question maybe would be on the long term side of things is more trying to try to take kind of like uh going to the future type type question where like imagining even five years from now and let's say all the progress you guys can see that you'd have over five years if you look at five years from now where can you guys see your organization's impact then in the future yeah so we just had our kickoff um, at the end of february to kick off the isaiah 117 home that's going to serve perry and spencer county it'll be one home that serves both counties um, since both counties are rural uh, we wanted to just best utilize the home. Um, we're going to have two counties for one home. But um, so ideally, the home will be, uh, it's not open yet, but we are raising awareness and working towards that. Um, Pre-COVID, it was usually it takes about 12 months to open. Um, now in the weird COVID world, things are more like 18 months. Um, so ideally, future-wise in 18 months, we'll have our doors open be fully stocked home with volunteers, with supplies, all of that. Five years down the road, I would love to see um, more Isaiah 117 homes pop up because like I said, the need is in every single county. Um, one home cannot serve you know, the entire Southern Indiana population, but we can do what we can to serve Perry and Spencer counties. And then if you know, the county starts seeing how this is just taking place, how the community is just rising up to meet the needs of the kids in their own community. We're hoping that other counties around us will join in and get their own homes going. Right now in Southern Indiana, there's an open home in Evansville, Vandenberg County. And then there's going to be another one later this year that's opening in Knox County. And then we will be the third home in Southern Indiana um that's going to be opening and then there's a couple more there's one up by um purdue that's going to be opening one in indianapolis and then one in boone county as well so there will be six homes eventually right now um, on track for indiana and then there's several in tennessee where the uh, organization started there's several in tennessee well, I, I, again, organic questions coming about here. Like uh, one of them that, that pops in my head initially is when you mentioned the volunteers that they'd be fully staffed and things like that. Do you, are, are you able to communicate to the audience, uh, like say there's for someone that will watch this later on, listen to this later on, and all of a sudden they would have interest in volunteering. How would someone go about uh, getting involved in this and, and maybe becoming a volunteer? Yeah, so there'll be tons of different volunteer opportunities. Um, right now, we have monthly um, expansion meetings just to plan out different creative ways to raise awareness. But once the home opens up, uh, we'll need volunteers, whether that's coming into the home and cleaning the home or caring for the kids or mowing the grass, different things that, you know, just the simple care of a home. And um, so anyone that would want to volunteer to tend to the kids We'll go through um, just standardized background checks, and then also um, they'll per, uh, they'll participate in the trauma informed care training. So that will just um, better inform them on just maybe the behaviors that they might see working with kids that are walking through trauma, how to handle those behaviors, uh, different things like that. Well, uh, I love it too, Jordan, like you did a good job of, uh, of providing, like it sounds like it's going to be very simple for people to get involved if they really want to be. And I love how you're trying to prepare them as to you're, you're educating them as well. Because I mean, I'm sure if someone's willing enough to want it, to be open up to, to volunteer, like you said, whether it's, it's cleaning things, mowing the grass, uh, knowing how to help and take care of the kids as well. I think that's significant. Now, the other organic question I had too is, uh, again, I'm trying to try to picture this home itself too, but do you guys have an idea of like, 
is there a max capacity level for this particular home when it comes to the children? Like, is it is it to where uh, only a few children could be there maybe at one time, or is it something greater, a greater number than that? So like I said, um, most of the kids on average, um, between the time that they're removed and the time that um, they find some sort of placement is about eight hours. Granted, that can be sometimes shorter, especially with babies. It tends to be shorter. Babies are easier to place usually. Um, a lot of times, unfortunately, you see teenagers that will have to stay there a lot longer. Um, sometimes we've seen teenagers that have had to stay there for days because they can't, um, I, there's one incident where a teenager was staying there, I think for like two weeks and, uh, was just unable to find a foster placement. And again, they're welcome to stay at the home as long as they need to, but, um, there's not necessarily a max capacity. Um, however, what we'll have it set up is, um, two bedrooms, one boy bedroom, one girl bedroom. And so you'll have multiple beds in that bedroom. I mean, multiple being like two or three, you're not going to just have kids on top of kids. Um, but then you'll have that. And then you'll have also two bathrooms. So you'll have one bathroom that has a bathtub for the younger kids or kids that were wanting to take a bath. And then you'll make sure to have another bathroom that has a shower, um, especially for the older kids that want that privacy as well. And so ideally, um, you won't have more than one, not one child, but like one family in the home at a time. But again, if you get multiple removals on one day and you have multiple kids in there, um, we're not violating any kind of HIPAA violation or anything like that. Um, if you have multiple families in the home at the same time, but ideally it'll just be one family at a time. You did a really good job walking through that. Uh, like I said, you're you're the perfect person to speak on this uh, on, on this housing situation. I mean, on, more than anything, it sounds like it's it's really well set up to where uh, you guys are kind of prepared for for different scenarios. But realistically, like you said, you're looking at an eight hour window uh, in most cases. But but still, like like I said, when it comes down to it, the the base th thing, what you guys are able to provide there, I think is is a wonderful thing. But we're going to continue to talk about it. And you actually did a good job of kind of tying in the next question. I had was when we talk about COVID, which we've dealt that on a personal level, all of us uh, ourselves. I mean, I can't believe we're all living through this, uh, particularly in our lives now. But but even for you, and maybe I'm going to change this question up for you as well. Is like you know I I've noted like has COVID impacted you know, how has COVID impacted you, uh, and but like for you personally, and also like your family, but also within this organization, what have been some of the challenges that you've additionally dealt with because of COVID? Yeah, so thankfully our kickoff was at the end of February. So I felt like whenever things started to open up in February or when we had our kickoff was kind of when things started to open up. So that did help um, a lot. So we have had to do some um, COVID restriction, just kind of managing our size, especially for like our meetings, our kickoffs, that kind of thing. Whenever there were limitations on how big of crowd size you could have for things. So that was one of our... Um, hurdles to jump over right now, I would say the most, the biggest thing that COVID um, is affecting us with is getting in and doing speaking engagements. Um, that's one of our ways that we're really wanting to raise awareness is getting in front of churches or civic groups or sports teams or, you know, school clubs, whatever. And um, just kind of painting a picture of a removal day and how the Isaiah 117 home is going to come in and try and fill that gap. We're really wanting to get in front of these groups and talk, but unfortunately, some groups aren't having outside volunteers, you know, come in and talk. So that has put a little bit of a damper on some of our speaking engagements, but overall, people have been pretty open. And it seems like the longer we go, more things are opening up and people are more. Um, open to let us come talk but we have had a little bit of issue there but it hasn't been too bad yeah it sounds like it's a, it's understandable it's definitely a realistic challenge so we're it, it can it, it, it's like, like i said you know what's the word i'm trying to look for it's just like basically help getting the word out there and spreading awareness about what you guys are doing and and yeah that that was definitely a, a little bit of a hurdle or a challenge but like i know as things continue to be to look optimistic and get better those opportunities will come i have no doubt in my mind because of the, the leaders that you guys have like much like yourself 
Uh, this next question, I, I, I might change it up a little bit. I know we talked about positive experiences and impacts you've had so far, stories that have tied to this. So within the organization, since it's been together, I'm sure you and those uh, else have been involved have heard a lot of positive things or been told a lot of positive things about what you're doing. So that's kind of my question more about so far as like, can you, you know, they call the people out specifically if you don't want to, but have you had a family or friends that have reached out to even you directly to uh, acknowledge you in this sense of having the involvement in this, like they're proud of you or, or they think it's a beautiful thing that you guys are doing. Have you had uh, situations like that? Yeah. Yeah. I've had several situations like that, but I think um, oh, several people have told me they're not surprised at all that I'm getting it, that I'm doing this, that it, um, it just, it fits who I am and what I, I'm passionate about, I've always been passionate about foster care and adoption and um, just really, you know, seeing these kids as just another asset for our community. I think so often that um, kids are seen as an inconvenience and I don't see them as an inconvenience at all. I think they're essential for society to function and our community. And um, I think God calls us to care for these kids. And so I just think that um, it was just kind of whenever I heard about Isaiah 117, it was, there wasn't any sort of hesitation. It was, oh, we have to do this. And, um, you know, just working with my husband to get him on board that took, you know, a little bit of planning, trying to figure out how to, you know, run a nonprofit and um, do it while raising a five-year-old and a two-year-old and my husband working full-time and just like anything else, but it has worked out great. Um, he has been a tremendous babysitter and, uh, it's, it's gone well, but yeah, overall, I think that, um, people in the community are really excited about this. And I think, again, once you paint the picture of removal day and what that looks like and how traumatic that is for the child and the caseworker and the foster family, all three of them go through trauma of different degrees on that day. Um, you paint that picture and I think it's really hard for people to turn a blind eye and to not to unsee the problem you can't unsee it um, these kids are ones that your kids go to school with and are on the baseball team and the 4-H club we're not talking about kids in another country they're right here in our community and I just think that once you paint that picture that people are really excited about it and wanting to help and it's been really great to see the kids in the community that are also really excited we've had schools that have done um pajama drives where they've collected pajamas for our house. And so we have those ready to go when the house opens. And we've had kids doing lemonade stands and their lemonade stand money um, gets donated to us. And so it's surprising and really great to see kids that are just so excited to help out other kids. Well, Jordan, sorry for the technical difficulty there, switching something over to share. Uh, no, but it, one of the things that stuck out to me there that you were speaking of, and again, great job on describing that. It, it really, to me, it sends a really powerful message for about people just becoming more aware of it and involved. And I think one of the things that really stuck out to me there that like clicked, uh, clicked in my head was about uh, sometimes we, we forget, like I think we all get like a, uh, like our worlds feel like they're really small whenever things that get bigger, that they're, that it becomes more magnitude. Like whenever you think of a, like a, a terrible type incident might, might happen like on the East coast or the West coast, you're like, you know, oh, that's a terrible thing or a terrible situation. You hope for the best. What, but like, like, I don't know if that's a great comparison to what I'm getting ready to say, but what comes to it is just when you're talking about these children that are involved at whatever age they are, you're, you're also not talking about a child that's coming all the way from like necessarily California all the way to here. These are kids right here within our community that are going through struggles that are around us. And I think to me that that sends a more uh, message closer to the heart that, you know, uh, how close that we always talk about our communities being too. So this is a chance for, to, to help those families or to help those kids that are involved in that. And I, I think this is also a great question as well, because when we talked about on COVID and, and getting the word out there and providing awareness, uh, this is another question I wanted to ask you too, is, is how can people find you in, in the organization and learn more about what you guys are trying to accomplish? I know I, I am familiar with the Facebook page and I will encourage people to find them as well. Is, is there any other routes as well as the Facebook page that you want to speak on uh, as, as in regards for people to find you? Yeah, so we have Facebook and Instagram accounts. Um, if you have one or the other, you can follow both, but they both have the same information on them. So if you have one of those, you're always welcome to get on that. 
Um, we have a website, Isaiah117house.com. You can go on there and it'll show you um, who we are. It has more videos on there from our um, president and founder. It has, um, it can show you where all the different houses are, what stage of the game all the houses are in, whether they're open or not yet. Um, tons of information on there as well. Um, as far as just local opportunities to get in touch with us, uh, we do have monthly expansion meetings. And so we're going to have those all the way up until August. So we're, this will be our awareness raising phase up until um, this fall. And um, so that's just an opportunity that if you are all in and you want to get busy now, then um, just kind of welcome you to come to the expansion meeting where right now we're planning out um, different events that we're going to do this summer. We got some luncheons planned. We got some lemonade stands planned. Um, T-shirts are love. You're not alone. That's um, our slogan that we always are using. Uh, we have T-shirts that we sell for those that we're going to be selling at um, several different stores in the community. And so just trying to figure out different ways um, that we can raise the most awareness because we want, again, to paint that picture for every single person in the community that, um, that they need to know what's going on on removal day and how we're going to change that. Yeah, I think that ties into really my last question on the show really well, which is, again, if you had to wrap this 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 particular part of the chapter of the show up, again, talking in, in, as a representative of this organization yourself, is if you had to send a last message to the audience or anybody that's listening in, you know, what would be that what would be that message that you would like to send to them? Yeah, I would just say um, to pay attention to your community, I think. I've never met anybody that says, I don't want to help my community out. I don't want to um, benefit my community in some way. And this is such a tangible way to help your community and help the kids in your community. Again, these kids are, you know, your neighbors and your friends and your classmates and sports team members. Um, they're right here in the community and these kids are begging for help and they're begging for someone to hear them, someone to say, you're not alone, that I'm gonna walk through this with you. Um, the caseworkers and the foster families are screaming the same exact thing that we need you, that we want somebody to tell us that we're not in this alone because I think the entire journey can be so isolating at times, whether you are the child or the caseworker or the foster family, you can feel so overwhelmed and so alone. And we just want to make sure that um, our message gets out to them and that we are that helping hand that's going to walk through them uh, or walk with them in these days um, that are really, really tough. And so we just, we want the community to be on board and to help us out, whether that is financially, whether that's through giving their time, whether that's just sharing our stuff on Facebook. Um, we just, we need the whole community for this. It's a community effort. Yeah. It's beautiful, Jordan. It's awesome. Uh, like I said, you did a fantastic job there. I know we're, it, it, my, my main feedback will be actually take place here in chapter three, which is our closing thoughts. And this is where I explained to Jordan and Chad. This is where we just kind of together, her and I will look back on this episode here and this experience overall and just kind of talk through it. And Jordan, let's kind of start with you. You know, we got to talk a little bit about your life too, you know, in chapter one. And, and you told me about your family. We talked about your career. There's a lot of, a lot of fun things that, that you discussed in there and things that inspired you. Uh, that, uh, that I'd love to get your thoughts on here that I'll share as well. Then in chapter two, you did, uh, again, a fantastic job speaking on the organization, also helped providing that word out there. And I hope this does reach many people as well. And now for you, like this experience, again, not your first podcast, uh, but looking back on this particular episode here, Jordan, what was this uh, like for you? It was great. Yeah, I'm really excited to um, be able to kind of be the voice behind this organization, and hopefully reach more people because that's our whole goal in all of this is just to get the word out. And I'm just one person. So I appreciate the help. Well, like I said, it's amazing what one person can do. To me, it sounds like you've done a lot, but 
badging uh, an army of you together just, just to see, like, the, I mean, really the sky's the limit of what you guys could really accomplish, not just within our counties in Spencer and Perry County, but like you said, one of the, you know, starting a, this this here with this home, you know, and, and people building off that, it, it could really just spread like a wave in a positive way throughout the throughout the state of Indiana, throughout across the country, and, and even the world in that sense, because this stuff I, I'm sure goes on across the world. But I know from my experience, Jordan, uh, again, I considered you a friend beforehand, but I didn't really know you on that level. I know knew of you, but but to get to actually go through chapter one, it was really it felt like I got to know you a lot more. Uh, I, I now know that you love meatloaf. Uh, a lot. I know I pointed that sometimes, but I love the fact that you talked about with with Christy again. It made me it made me think of growing up in Candleton. You know, I grew up in Candleton, and I live in Tell City now. And we got we got small and you know you know this area well too. Uh, but also just talking through this organization, I was very uh, curious and very uh, open to wanting to be educated more on on what you guys were doing and what the struggles that i think this parts that stuck with me the most is i i got the message that you guys provided and and all that but it was the experiences that you walked through that really stuck with me like the eight-year-old girl and, and what you know what that was like and it just felt heartbreaking to imagine what that's like and that is one situation out of thousands and thousands of situations that you guys have all probably dealt with or people in your field there. Uh, but no, to me, uh, I feel like you've made me less ignorant. Uh, you've made me appreciate uh, the foster system, you know, what the hard work that you guys go through as well, what this organization's uh, doing and trying to do and continue to do forward. I, and I hope to be one of those that as, is advocating for your guys' support. Uh, and I'm right there to help you guys try to share, sell any shirts and get the word out. And, and if there's anything I could do to help, you know, please let me know. Uh, but other than that, it, it's been it's been great. I'm, I've been sorry for the delay. We were going to do this episode, I think, a month or two ago, and it got delayed. But I'm now glad that we we, we kind of made some time, put some time aside, and being able to talk about Dimes Night. And you were excellent. Like, you're very confident. You're very comfortable being in front of the camera. And I can see why you're such a leader and a voice uh, within this organization, within your, your own family and friends as well in your community. So, uh, again, the sky's the limit for you too, Jordan. So I'd say more than anything, thank you for, for coming on to Chapters and – and I do hope this isn't your only appearance ever. Maybe one of these days we'll be able to, to touch base. I'd love to do like even like five years from now to come back and see where this organization is now or just even see how you're doing and how your family's doing and your kids are growing. So we'll have to maybe do that sometime. But but anyways, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up for the audience. I do appreciate everybody on Facebook Live tonight uh, for joining us. Uh, for those that might have interacted with us through Twitter, I appreciate that as well. I do not know exactly the confirmed date on the next show. I do have a, a guest. I'm actually doing kind of a graduation series coming up, Jordan. I have a couple of uh, recent graduates that are going to be talking about kind of that younger generation and, and, and life going through high school and, and what that future looks like for them heading into college and, and what their aspirations was. You remember when we were younger, you know, I was thinking of a million different things I wanted to do for a living, and then I ended up working at a factory for myself. But but anything, uh, it, it's been a quite the, it's been an awesome experience. Like I said, ex everything that I wanted to get from it, uh, I felt like I did. It, it was fun, uh, inspirational, and, and very educational. So thank you again, Jordan, for your time. Yeah, and I do wish you. you, if you don't mind, hang around just real quick after this for a formal goodbye. But anyways, uh, again, appreciate the audience. Please stay tuned. We'll be uh, posting pretty shortly on whenever the next episode will be. But this has been Chapters, Real People, Real Stories.